You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC-98 Paradise, the series where we take a close look at classic games for the NEC PC-98, the most popular Japanese PC series of the early 1990s. And apologies if my voice sounds funny, it's allergy season already here in Japan. When I first started collecting Japanese PC games in the early 2000s, there were two developers that I considered to be the biggest and best in the scene. The first, of course, was Nihon Falcom, who regulars of this channel will already know I tend to talk way too much about. And the other was TGL, which stands for Technical Group Laboratory. You may not be as familiar with this one, but to me at the time, these two companies were like Coke and Pepsi. They were the two major food groups of the Japanese PC gaming world. TGL began making games in 1992. If you're a console gamer, some of their series you may have heard of are Steam Hearts and the VG or Variable Geo series of fighting games. No? But by far the longest running series they released as TGL was the Farland series of turn-based strategy games. It started out as Farland Story for the first eight games, and then when they changed it to an isometric perspective it became Farland Saga for two games then Farland Odyssey for another two games, before finally ending with Farland Symphony in 2002. Before moving on to Windows, the first seven Farland Story games were released on the NEC PC-98, since it was the most popular computer series in Japan at the time. These games all have very similar gameplay, so at first I was thinking maybe I would make a single video as an overview of the series, but that's not really my style. I think every game deserves a full video of its own, so this video will be a close examination of the very first Farland story, released in 1993. And by the way, if you hate turn-based strategy, then try this game. This is the series that really got me into the genre. And best of all, this is one of the few PC-98 games that has an English patch available, so the language barrier is no excuse. So here's the game. And let's also take a look at the back cover while we're at it. Inside we have a small fold-out poster with the same illustration as the cover. Next there's the manual, which is in black and white. The game itself is contained on four floppy disks. As you can see, I have the 5 inch floppy disk version, so I'll be using 3.5 inch backups. I don't have a 5 inch drive on this PC-98 yet. The game can be played either directly from the floppy disks or installed on the hard drive. The installation program is contained on disk C. Here I'll select my source floppy drive which in my case is drive C. And for the destination disk I'll select my internal hard drive A and let it create the default installation directory FS. It will then ask me to insert each of the four floppies as it copies over the data. Once the installation is finished, I can start the game by running fs.bat in the root directory of my hard drive. As a form of copy protection, it will ask me to insert disk A every time I start the game. The hard drive install is a little rough around the edges. To watch the opening, you can either boot disk D of the game, or to watch it from the hard drive, you have to run a separate program named fsop.bat. The opening then repeats endlessly and you have to reset the system to get out. Similarly, you can't exit back to DOS from the main game either. If you select quit game from the main menu, it just gives you a useless screen telling you to turn the power off. And when you start a new game, it warns you that you had better make a user disk before starting. But then if you go and select create user disk from the main menu, it says that a user disk is unnecessary when playing from the hard drive. I love that the creator of the English patch made sure to give these screens the proper treatment. The quit game option has been changed to don't quit game, and the user disk warning was replaced with a similar funny message. Anyway, let's go back and watch the opening by running fsop.bat. It's graphics only with no text, and like many game openings it shows the characters you'll meet throughout the game, so it might make more sense if you watch it again after playing part way through. But overall it's a really nice opening by PC-98 standards, and includes some simple animation used to very good effect. TGL always put a lot of resources into character design and making it all look good in pixel art as well, and you'll find it only gets better in subsequent games. This big head style on the cover does represent the game's style pretty well, but it looks awkward compared to the more refined artwork of the later games. 
So let's start a new game from the main menu and ignore that stupid user disk warning. We're taken finally to the game engine, where we get the initial plot set up. The protagonist's girlfriend, Ferio, is walking with her friend Mel, when they're suddenly kidnapped by a black knight without explanation. Then we scroll up to see our main protagonist, Ark, and his friend, Rantia, conversing nearby. They are interrupted by a cleric named Alicia, who informs them that their village was suddenly attacked by the demon army, Ferio and Mel were kidnapped, and that she herself just barely managed to escape. Ark and Rantia need to hurry back to the village with Alicia, and stage one begins with these three playable characters. Playing the Farland story games is so simple that I found even without an English patch I could easily figure out how to play even before my Japanese was good enough to read any of the commands. It's really just move and attack and you'll figure out the more advanced options like items and equipment later. I had a blast playing this first stage again here for the first time in decades. Wow, I forgot this game is so fun! What really sets Farland story apart are the battle animations. It's probably most similar to the early Fire Emblem games, but these cute, super deformed graphics are something else and were quite detailed and fluid for their time. They're a treat to watch, and hitting the enemies is so satisfying I've never even considered turning them off in order to make the game go faster. Instead, I prefer to change the animation speed to high. It's just as much fun to watch at high speed. The other system option I like to change is the movement speed. You then unfortunately lose the walking animation on the map, but otherwise playing the game just starts to take too long in the later stages. If you don't mind missing out on even more detail, you can even change to a more zoomed out view in order to see more of your surroundings at once. I don't use this very often. By the way, this is the first game I've covered on PC98 Paradise, which requires a mouse. I'm currently using a real PC98 ball mouse, but what I'd really like to have is one of these USB to PC98 mouse converters so I could use a modern optical mouse instead. Unfortunately, the guy who makes them stopped and they seem to be impossible to obtain now. Eventually, I'll probably cave and splurge on one of ClassicPC.org's pricey converters instead. The main strategy of Far Land Story is paying attention to whether characters and enemies are capable of attacking from nearby or from a distance of one space away. For instance, if you attack an enemy from nearby and that enemy is also capable of attacking nearby, you'll be immediately counterattacked. Your characters will also counterattack enemies when they are capable of doing so. You want to try to attack enemies without getting counterattacked when you can. It's super simple and you'll pick it up right away. The characters gain experience every time they attack an enemy. Alicia is the healer, and that's mostly what you'll use her for every turn, but unfortunately, characters don't gain experience from healing. This is rectified in later games, but here, in order to level her, you've got to carefully use her to finish off some of the enemies when you get a chance. If you don't try to level all the characters pretty evenly, you may regret it later in the game when things get harder. Another issue with the leveling system is that the characters max out at just level 20 and will no longer gain experience after that. Killing enemies without getting experience feels wasteful, so I find myself trying not to use characters anymore once their level is maxed out. If Ark is killed, it's game over instantly. Thank goodness this game has an autosave feature which allows you to redo your last turn if you need to. If the other characters are killed, they're taken down a level, which also sucks. So while often unavoidable, you'll want to minimize casualties as much as possible. If a character is killed, you can use Alicia's healing magic to revive them, or the standard revival item of the Farland series, whiskey. That's a taste that ought to wake the dead. Equipment is also super simple because it's limited to weapons only, there's no armor or shields or anything like that. On a side note, the enemies are also constantly dropping useless weapons, which you can sell at any time in the menus. This makes for a pretty good side hustle if you need more money to buy items and weapons at any of the towns scattered about the maps. Another thing you'll find on the maps is plenty of hidden treasure chests. These are usually indicated by one of these flowery patches, but later in the game they are also often hidden under a tree or rock that looks suspiciously out of place. Some of these are a bit out of the way, and I find I often need to send out a scout in order to retrieve them, while I waste no time using the remaining characters to progress through the stage. Farland Sori also has a class change system. One thing you'll find in the hidden chests are special weapons which will upgrade certain characters to a better class, as long as they have reached at least level 10. This is often easier said than done. In this playthrough, I had a hell of a time getting Alicia to level 10, and wasn't able to finally upgrade her from a cleric to a priest until the second last stage of the game. 
But I don't want to give the impression that this is a difficult game. Even if you just hack away without worrying about which characters you're leveling, you shouldn't have too much trouble finishing it. In contrast, I find most other turn-based strategy games to be much harder. I'm a little embarrassed to admit that I've never even finished a single game in my other favorite turn-based series, Langrisser. I love those games, but about halfway through, they all suddenly tend to become brutally difficult, or at least I find them to be. Feel free to make fun of me in the comment section. But anyway, the point is, the Farland games are aimed at novice players, and even if you hate turn-based strategy, you'll probably find that you can pick up and finish one of these games if you give them a chance. Be careful though, like me, this might serve as your doorway into a genre that you were already pretty sure you didn't much care for. The plot of the first Farland game is a simple one. It starts out as a standard damsel in distress story, with Ark trying to save his love interest, Ferio. Later we learn that the demon army has taken control of the kingdom's royal palace, and the evil queen is attempting to revive a dark lord. There are four seals that were used to send the dark lord back to the demon world long ago, and the demon army needs to obtain four keys in order to unlock them. It's up to Ark and his companions to try and find them before the demons do. Along the way, a new playable character will be added in almost every stage, with all four tribes of the Farland world represented. From the dwarves, you have Dokati, a former general of the royal kingdom who seems to have known Ark from a young age, as well as his old friend Godar. For the elves, you have Lisa, an archer, and Lucida, the chief of the elf tribe. The sirens are winged beings who are useful for traveling over obstacles like water. Some of them are bards like Miria, who has the ability to grant an additional turn to any of your spent characters. I always found this to be one of the more crazy and interesting abilities in the series. The last of the four tribes is the humans, of course. In addition to Ark and the other human characters named earlier, there are wizards like Dino here. A minor issue worth mentioning is a graphical glitch that occurs in this game on some PC-98 models, where the battle window gets repeated in the lower portion of the screen. It's a little annoying, but doesn't render the game unplayable. Luckily, this issue doesn't occur on this particular PC-98, but I have observed it on other models I used to own. Thankfully, this issue was fixed from the second game on. The music in the first Farland game is pretty decent by PC-98 standards overall. It sounds pretty similar to other TGL games released around the same time. Decently pleasant, but nowhere near the standards of companies like Nihon Falcom. However, starting with the second game, I can hear a huge jump in quality, with much more interesting compositions and more pleasant sounds used. Maybe even giving companies like Falcom a run for their money. Another thing that holds the first game's soundtrack back a bit is that the music changes during the enemy turns, meaning that it is constantly switching between two different tracks. From the second game on, the same stage music just stays on through both the player and enemy turns, making way for longer tracks that you get to actually hear played in their entirety, several times over. The first game is compatible with a total of four different types of sound hardware to choose from. The first marked simply FM is the original Monoral 26K FM soundboard. 86 is the stereo 86K FM soundboard, which you've been hearing throughout this video. MT is short for MT32, one of the most popular MIDI modules of the time. It used the LA MIDI standard, so instead I'll be using the only LA compatible module I have, the CM64 which may not reproduce the sounds entirely accurately. By the way, this is the only game in the series which offers this option. Finally, there's also GS MIDI, which I'll be producing with the CM300. Let's compare all four options now.
Next, let's talk about the rest of the game's story. I'm gonna get into spoiler territory, so watch at your own discretion. It turns out that Ark's girlfriend, Ferio, is the descendant of the family who sealed away the Dark Lord, and is the only one who can perform the ceremony to revive him, so that's why the bad guys want her. The Black Knight who kidnapped her is a man named Diva, who was disgraced by Ark when he lost to him in a friendly battle prior to the events of the game. And surprise surprise, it turns out Ark is a prince, and rightful heir to the kingdom. Hey, I'm a prince! I'm a prince! When the current queen took the throne 15 years ago, she tried to have Ark, the son of the former queen, killed, but the dwarf Dukati hid him away and had him raised by his friend Rantia. When Ark and company storm the castle near the end of the game, they defeat the evil queen's daughter, Eleanor, only to realize afterward that she was Ark's half-sister, since their father was the same deceased king. Don't worry though, she isn't dead, and is a playable character in the second game. Next, they defeat the evil queen, but it's too late. The ceremony to revive the Dark Lord is complete. The final stage has Ark and company defeating the Dark Lord themselves in the demon world. In the end, the Dark Lord is vanquished again, and the four keys that seal him or her away are entrusted to four members of your party, as representatives of the four tribes of the world. We get a short sequence showing what each of the characters is up to after the story, as well as a summary of each character's final class, level, and how many enemies they took down throughout your game, so you can find out who's your MVP. Hey, that's not really fair, the healers did their part too. If there is one major downside to Farland's story, it would have to be the fact that it's rather time consuming to play. The later stages are huge and moving your characters about them can take considerable time. This can be alleviated a bit by using the order system. At any time you can click on Ark and have him order the party to gather near him. Then you can just move Ark forward and the remaining characters will all move as close to him as possible at the end of each turn. This works pretty well until the characters need to navigate around walls or rivers. The AI, if it could even be called that, simply tries to move the characters toward Ark. I feel like I've had to complain about poor AI a lot in my recent videos, which is weird since I've never really considered that to be one of my major pet peeves in gaming or anything. It seems I just happen to be covering a lot of games where that's an issue lately. Anyway, you'll need to move the characters manually in order to get them around areas like these. A testament to how time-consuming these games are is the fact that I've owned all seven of the PC-98 titles for decades, and yet I've only found time to play and finish the first and fifth one. Why the fifth one? It just happened to be the first one I got my hands on when I started collecting PC-98 games. Finishing all of these games has always been on my bucket list though. Hopefully, if my viewers are interested in seeing me cover more of these games, I can take the time to finish and make videos about some of the subsequent games in the future. But for the remainder of this video, let's take a look at all the ports of the first game. The only straight port of the first game was on MS-DOS, and only available in Taiwan. It's very similar to the PC-98 version, but the only sound options are MIDI, which sounds about the same as the original, or Sound Blaster, which sounds like a mess. Farland Story for the Super Famicom is a remake of the first two PC-98 games in one. As you can see, the graphics have been pretty dramatically redrawn, but the music is from the originals and arranged pretty well. The rules have also been changed a bit, and you can now move your characters through your allies, like in most strategy games, and the level caps at 20 have been thankfully removed. I haven't played this one very much, but overall it seems pretty decent. Farland Story FX is also a remake of the first two PC-98 games, for the NEC PC FX. This time not only the graphics, but also the music is completely different. The game overall has been simplified a bit, featuring smaller maps with less characters and enemies on them. The fact that there's loading time and a music change that occurs every time you attack or get attacked makes the game feel considerably more tedious to play today. As a longtime PCFX collector, this is actually the first Farland game I ever played, and I remember not minding this back in the 90s. I really loved watching the battle animation and never turned it off. I also love the PCFX mouse support in this game. It's one of the few PCFX games that has a partial English patch available. The menus and text are all in English, but unfortunately the story is told entirely through FMV and voice sequences with no subtitles, so you won't get any of the story in English. 
Still, I have a nostalgic soft spot for this version, and I highly recommend it. The PCFX game was then ported to the PlayStation 1 as Farland Story Yotsu no Fuin, which means Four Seals. It's nearly identical to the PCFX version, except for some transition effects added before the battle animation. The disc access is still a big issue though. This version adds text to the voice parts, so it's kind of unfortunate this one doesn't also have an English patch. The same PCFX and PS1 game was also ported to Windows. The overhead graphics had to be completely redrawn in this one, but it's otherwise the same. It runs ridiculously fast on my modern Windows 10 PC, and at first I found the battle animation to be way too fast, but once I got used to it, it's actually perfect. The disc access issues of the PCFX and PS1 versions are non-existent here, so this may actually be the best version to play today if you're looking for a much more fast-paced experience. I turned it on just to capture a bit of footage and found I couldn't put it down through the first few stages. Again, no English patch though. The game system was gradually streamlined a bit in the later Farland Story games, though all of the PC-98 titles seem to use basically the same game engine. It could be argued that since these games are all so similar, it must have been easy to keep churning them out every year. But that would be ignoring all the brand new character design, animation, story, and music that had to be created for each game. Even at the height of the series, the number of new Farland games was only... Three per year? Okay, I take it back. It was probably pretty easy for TGL to keep shoveling out new games in this series. And for a while, it was likely a decent money printing scheme for the company. I still love all the ones I've played so far, though. But all good things come to an end. The final Farland game, Farland Symphony, released in 2002, was a buggy mess so bad it had to be pulled from shelves and repackaged as Farland Symphony Encore. A shame it had to go that way, since it was actually a really good game in my opinion. TGL then separated their gaming division into a subsidiary called TGL Kikaku in 2003, and for a while began only releasing games under their adult label, Giga. Then in 2013, they began releasing some of the Giga games on the PS Vita under the TGL name, with the adult scenes removed. And finally in 2016, TGL Kikaku was renamed to Entergram, and the Giga adult label was coincidentally retired this month, March 2023. So to sum up, TGL sort of still exists as Entergram, and they still actually release a lot of games every year for Windows, PS4, and Switch. The vast majority of their games, though, are romance-themed graphic adventures, which I'm sure will only appeal to a limited number of people watching this video. To me, TGL's prime was in the 90s, and they left plenty of games that I still hope to play through and experience. The Farland games will always be one of my favorite strategy series, and an excellent choice for something to play on PC-98. Thanks for watching this episode of PC98 Paradise. Please like, share, and subscribe if you enjoyed it, and a special thanks goes to my patrons on Patreon. This has been your host, Mr. Jakes.